here we are for the, um, I think this is the 18th week of the WSU Food Systems Hub. Um, we like to start each of our hub meetings with an image from a prior event. This is a farm walk that happened in June of 2019 in the Winthrop Twisp area at um, one of the fields owned by uh, Sam the farmer at Bluebird Grain Farms, or leased by him at least. Um, and it was a beautiful day, hot, dusty, um, but uh, definitely amazing. And Sam was such an awesome and gracious host. So um, yeah, we just like to look back on uh, awesome in-person events like that. So welcome everybody. Um, today on the Hub, we are gonna have some uh, guest speakers for our, our Washington Farmers Markets. Uh, with us today is Colleen Donovan from the Washington State Farmers Market Association and Jennifer Antos from the Seattle Neighborhood Farmers Markets. They're both gonna um, share a little bit about their organizations and of course the uh, work that's been going on to support farmers and farmers markets. Um, throughout the pandemic. And as usual, we will open up for discussion. Please um, be ready with some questions and anything else that you would like to share with us for the day. As you enter our Zoom room, please introduce yourself. Uh, take a moment to do that in the chat box. Um, who you are, where you are located, what you do, um, and then also please utilize the chat box for any questions or other events, links, or resources that you would like to share with the group. Um, we do continually grab uh, those resources and links from the chat box. It all gets funneled through our online resource hub as well, which is um, a part of this. So um, I wanted to also, as Laura had mentioned, uh, everyone is a little bit in different places getting set for our quinoa symposium, which is gonna be fully online and free. And then I don't know, um, I'm gonna assume that Ab is not on the line with us and is busy doing other things, yes. And Laura, do you wanna say a little bit more about what's gonna be going on? Yeah, um, so our it came, the International Quinoa Research Symposium is going to be Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday of this coming week. Um, we have over a thousand people registered from 57 different countries, and we have many speakers from around the world as well. So today we're doing our tech uh, testing to make sure all of our technology works out. Um, so Abba's uh, with a group of facilitators right now on Zoom from around the world. So. We're really excited about this um, symposium. It's also our first fully online event that we've hosted since uh, COVID. We're also um, encouraging all of you who didn't register to be able to go and watch the uh, conference unfold um, on our YouTube channel. So you can find all of that information at quinoasymposium.com uh, where you can also find the program. So uh, registration closed on the 10th. But uh, like I said, you can still watch uh, the conference on YouTube and it will um, all of the uh, all of the presentation materials will be freely available as well after the conference. So I uh, just wanted to put a plug in for uh, the International uh, Symposium and thank the Sustainable Seed Systems Lab for um, their partnership. So they were the ones that brought us on board to pr pr produce this event. So Awesome. And um, who was brought on to produce the event was the food systems program. And we are um, made up of our core team, which I uh, forgot to mention today. So myself, I'm Nicole Witham, the statewide coordinator for the program. Dr. Laura Lewis is our director. Uh, Abba Kaiser, our project manager, who is busy toiling away on quinoa work right now. And then Tia Taylor, who is our office um, goddess. And uh, so that makes up our core team. And of course, we have a lot of other food systems team members across the state. Here we have um, our mission statement. And you can see um, 
these uh, different focus areas. So our program grew out of the roots of what was the small farms program at Washington State University. And now we've entered a kind of broaden our scope for a more holistic view of the food system to include these items that you see. Um, and as I said, we have a statewide reach with our programming and with all of our different um, partners, uh, along with extension offices throughout the state. And um, we also uh, really value our non-WSU collaborators and partners who are also members of the food systems team. And so the hub, um, which I will say we've done a, a slight bit of rebranding. Um, we, we started this, like I said, about 18 or so weeks, weeks ago, give or take, maybe 20 weeks ago. And um, originally, to bring statewide leaders in the food system together to collaborate um, to help build uh, resilience throughout the pandemic. And we acknowledge that there are so many interconnected things within the food system that we didn't want to um, keep ourselves uh, kind of closed into just COVID. And so now we have switched this up and moved on to call it the food systems hub where we still venture to do uh, basically the same thing, bringing together our friends and partners and leaders within the Washington food system to collaborate and to share information. So thanks for being here. You're, you're, you're interacting um, as part of the hub today. And um, you can also go online to find um, a number of different tools that are part of that, including farm finder, statewide farm finders, um, our dynamic needs assessment tool, and our calendar of events. Um, this is just a shot of some things that are happening obviously today and um, some other things that are happening. It's something we continually try to update. Please also feel free to share items with me um, so that, that I can get them added to our calendar. Another thing that I mentioned before is our needs assessment tool. This is still happening and we are still um, happily pestering you to fill out your weekly food systems needs assessment. Um, this is to help inform um, all resource allocation and decision making throughout the state to track changes uh, around the food system throughout time and needs and different things. It's definitely helped us to seek out different resources and resource providers to bring to you on the hub and um, we hope to continue uh, collecting useful data through this tool. So again, as I mentioned before, our guests for today, um, if there aren't anything, uh, anything else that anybody would like to ask or share before we roll on, um, I'm going to hand things off. Does anybody have any questions before we get going? Awesome. So uh, thank you again, Colleen and Jennifer. Uh, let me know what you guys would like, who it is that's sharing screens and whatnot, and I will hand things off to you. Right now, I'll go ahead and share my screen here. And Nicole, you'll let me know when you can see it, right? It's coming up now, looks like it. Yep. Good. Good? Yep. Okay, well, fantastic. Well, thank you so much uh, to Laura and to Nicole for uh, having Jennifer and I here today. We're um, really thrilled with this opportunity to pause for a second and stop back and uh, step back to talk about where we are with farmers markets uh, this year in particular. It's been very exciting. And um, so we're just going to take that statewide picture, uh, make sure we all have the same baseline information about our farmers markets here in Washington. Then we're gonna dig into and talk about what the impacts of COVID-19 have been and uh, farmers markets, how they've been able to adapt on a dime with a dime and really turn things around to be able to continue to serve as important marketplaces for farmers and for shoppers. And then we're going to dig into um, uh, the, what's have been happening in the Seattle context. And Jennifer's going to tell you about her um, adventures with uh, COVID and farmers markets in the city of Seattle. 
Um, and then we just really want to cap this all off by really summarizing where we are and what we see as being next and what's going to be most important to sustain our farmers markets here in Washington. And um, with that, um, and, and Nicole, is it fair to say that we'll have questions at the end or how do you prefer that I see Laura nodding her head so well yeah feel free to feel free to just kind of cruise along and usually we will help facilitate and field things through the chat box and we can definitely open up more for discussion okay later. Yeah. Fantastic. And <clears throat> to be fair, we have, a, we have this chock full of a lot of really great information. And I know many of you are familiar uh, with the uh, markets in our state. And so again, we're trying to add in that larger context, that, lar that larger picture, as well as some of the specifics that maybe you weren't aware of. And um, we're going to go pretty fast. And again, really welcome that discussion at the end as well. So um, with that, um, the Washington State Farmers Market Association is a nonprofit organization. This having Washington State in the beginning of your name can uh, make people think that you're part of the state, I've, I've learned. But we are a nonprofit founded over 40 years ago and have over 110 member farmers markets located in 30 counties around the state. Um, we have staff in Bellingham, Seattle, and I'm in Ellensburg. We also work with uh, regional leads who are uh, contracted with us to help with SNAP-Ed and work directly with farmers markets. They work with a lot of WSU partners uh, throughout the state helping on the food access side of things. Um, and also we have a statewide board and I just want to do a shout out to Pat Munts who I see here is on a, the WSFMA board as well as um, uh, Heidi Peroni who I know is a frequent member of the hub uh, food systems team, and uh, Patrice Barentine, who's been with us for many, many, many years and serves an important advisory role, um, and, and many others. And Laura Raymond is a former bed board member. So we have a lot of strong connections with the food systems team, for sure. So um, with that, um, we do have a directory um, that is highlighting the COVID friendly farmers market. Um, you can pick one up at your local member market. And if you have any need to have a larger quantity that you can distribute to people who would be interested, we'd be happy to send those, those out in bulk. It's a little tricky distributing, distributing uh, things this year as nobody's going to their office. So um, any ideas you have about that would be great. We do have a farm finder on our website and um, work really hard to keep that as accurate as possible. We're in connection with all of our markets all the time and so um, hope to get those updates uploaded and corrected as soon as they come in. Um, also, we do have regional, uh, regional re rack cards that have lists of farmers markets. Those are specifically targeting um, uh, shoppers using SNAP or FMNP, and so they know which markets have those um, available. So with that, um, um, I also wanted Jennifer to introduce herself and the Neighborhood Farmers Markets. Good morning. Thanks, Colleen. Um, I'm Jennifer, the Executive Director of the Neighborhood Farmers Markets in Seattle. And this organization is one of four Seattle organizers uh, who um, coordinate and organize farmers markets across the city. Um, we were founded in 1993 and are a 501c3 nonprofit organization. And pre-COVID, the, um, the programs and sort of scope of the organization included seven markets, three of them which were year round and are operating now and four seasonal markets, um, typically between May and October, and only one of those is operating currently during our pandemic. Um, we serve over 200 farm and food producers, and about 125 of those are farmers, specialty crop growers, protein, um, dairy, foragers, um, so, so primary product producers. Um, and then uh, about 75 of those are, are processors um, who use and source local food, um, many of, many of, much of the sourcing coming from uh, growers who participate in the markets and in that network. 
Um, and then we've uh, included over the years um, prepared food as well, which is currently not um, not in the markets. But that's a little bit about our scope on the on the supply side and and who we serve and um, and seven different neighborhoods in Seattle, as I mentioned. Um, and uh, in, in addition to the farmers markets, we have prioritized um, food access and implementing um, various programs from SNAP EBT um, to Fresh Bucks, which was piloted in our organization over 10 years ago now. Um, and in, in, as well, we have um, for many years had uh, what's called the Good Farmer Fund, which provides emergency relief, stopgap, um, uh, fi financial relief to farmers who experience typically natural disasters, crop failure um, in their in the course of their their farming season. Um, since the since the COVID pandemic, we've also included uh, a few different programs, which I'll I'll talk about more towards the end of the presentation. But um, I'll touch uh, more deeply on the farm to food bank work that's been happening in the emergency food system, the advocacy that has really ramped up in our organization um, and what consumer education looks like right now. So that's a little bit about us. Great, thank you so much, Jennifer. So we wanted to stop, start today uh, by stepping back for um, a minute and just really trying to situate farmers markets within the larger food systems and, and the roles that they play. And, um, as you know, farmers markets are a tricky entity in that they're part shopping mall. They rent space to independent retail businesses. They're, they're part chamber of commerce in that they're out there promoting and building the capacity of their, uh, of their vendors. They're also part social movement and they play an important role in local foods, food access, uh, community food security, um, and, and more. Um, in, and in addition, they're also um, very much situated with one foot in the formal economy and one foot in the informal economy. And so they can, they lend themselves to um, a lot of malleability and in, in, in interpretation. And so it's important for us to remember that the market is this nexus of local foods collaboration, and it takes on a lot of different roles and it brings a lot of different energy and social capital to any community and to the people participating in it. So I just wanted to start with that larger framing so that we all can, can remember that. Um, and I also wanted to highlight uh, the role of the farmers market organizers. And I, um, I noticed that Natalie Quist was on the call today and there's a picture of her as she worked with the Carnation Farmers Market last season. And these organizers are really um, our primary constituency at the WSFMA and that they hold this role of keeping the market together and they're shouldering an enormous uh, job uh, in, in, the, in their markets and in their communities. They are the workhorses of the local food system. They also are this year essential workers. They're frontline workers. They are um, out there making sure that these markets happen. And um, we have been meeting every week, uh, like you, um, since this started. Uh, we're also on about COVID convo number 18 or so. And um, it's, a, it's a hard year. They're really struggling. Um, the, the, you know, they come in to host a, a fabulous community event that benefits what they care about, which is farming and food and community. And right now they're being asked to be the, um, uh, the, the fun police. Um, and so they're in a very different role and it's been very tricky to, um, to acknowledge and to realize um, all that they're doing this year. So um, just wanted to kind of put them on the map as um, key players in all of this. Uh, Another key point here is that we know that farmers markets serve this Rubik's Cube of interests. Um, they have uh, every possible uh, point of entry, whatever you um, care most about, whether it's fighting hunger or saving farms or incubating small businesses or revitalizing a downtown. 
And these themes are transcended across the market system, but they really play out individually in each community and reflect what that community cares about. So there's so many points of entry in terms of what markets are achieving and what they care about. And the important thing is, is to realize that there's this mix of different interests and that for every single community, it's going to look a little different, even though they share these, these common outcomes. Um, and, la and just a few more key points. And one is that um, farmers markets are also in a situation where they are shouldering whatever interests and whatever need their community um, is most passionate about. And so they're um, stepping up in a lot of different ways to, to meet the needs of the day. And this also um, has extended into some of the more recent um, protests and so on. And so they're, they're embedded within their community and as a result of that, anything that's happening is going to get reflected in the market. And sometimes we're equipped to handle that and sometimes we're not. And so that's a real, um, just an important point of the, the, the role that they're playing. Um, in recent years, farmers markets have also taken on more and more um, leadership and partnership around food access programs. And I wanted to make sure everybody here today knew that this SNAP market match is a new statewide logo and branding for the program rolled out by the Department of Health. It has um, absorbed all of the different brandings, whether it was um, uh, fresh bucks or uh, double up food box or whatever the case may be and tried to synchronize the messaging and the branding across the state throughout markets and now calling it snap market match. This is currently funded by the state and we hope to get federal money to uh, um, expand it and continue it next year. That's um, pending. Um, but right now, uh, this is the key matching program that's being rolled out. Um, and there are currently 110 markets participating in this and demand has been sky high um, for this. The other key program in the food access arena that farmers markets really play an important role on is, is the farmers market nutrition program. And again, I just wanted everybody here to know that we have new branding for the farmers market nutrition program and um, these new purple signs are what are being introduced and rolled in. I can guarantee you the old ones will be around for a long time because farmers never want to get rid of a sign to save their life. But um, that's, uh, if you see that, that's being rolled out just this year. Um, and that program alone um, contributed $1.4 million directly into the pockets of farmers in 2019, of which, of which uh, the most, the vast majority um, over 84% was through farmers market. So this is a ma major, major program for food access in the state. Um, interestingly, if you look at the data, the senior program is always larger than the WIC pro program, even though the WIC is um, usually what people think of first. So it's, it's just an important program that farmers markets have taken on and are doing a great job about. Um, Overall, performance is strong within the state. This, this data represents our member markets. We collect data on an annual basis and uh, um, track what's going on around the state. Um, so we're approaching almost 60 million in total vendor sales, total reported vendor sales. So we understand that this is a conservative figure, but this is what we have backup for. And um, over half of that is from farms. So this is um, some of the some of the things that we, we track at the WSFMA and um, really are trying to watch the larger market trends. Um, digging in a little bit, I just wanted to flag uh, King County markets. Um, the WSFMA has a partnership with King County and we work to produce a data report every year. And I wanted to just flag this as, um, the important role that King County plays in the farmers market network. They represent over a third of our members and a large portion of the state's farmers markets. It's one of the largest markets, uh, uh, consumer markets. So it's very, very important. And within that, 
Seattle, the city of Seattle, those 15 markets um, that Jennifer is a part of really shoulder an enormous uh, lift when it comes to providing markets for farmers from around the state. So we have to remember that there's a lot of interconnectivity and relationships between what's going on in our demographic core and the rest of the state. And so I um, uh, just wanted to really uh, highlight their importance and this will um, play into what Jennifer shares in, uh, in a few minutes. Um, the, other, the other piece that um, we've been thinking about a lot is um, just really thinking through what this impact of COVID has been. And if we step back and we think, okay, what was the business model of farmers markets before COVID? And this is a sketch. This is equivalent to that drawing of the Pike Place market that we saw a few minutes ago. And this is really um, mostly for a nonprofit organization. It's gonna tweak a little bit if it's a city run market or if it's a private market. But really at our core, the value propositions of the farmers markets are to create affordable weekly retail spaces for small independent businesses that have aligned values. They're local, they're, they're, it's hand done, it's artisan, whatever, whatever the criteria is. And the job of the market, the value proposition is to bring these shoppers into the markets. We're going to support these businesses. And they, again, work with the food access and they are more and more providing safe, family-friendly entertainment and the public square of, of, of our time. Um, so they are really at their core shouldering this work and their customers are primarily the vendors and we can, we're gonna talk about that a little bit more in addition to certain funding partners. Now, if you're a city-run market, you're gonna have the taxpayers in the mix. But um, again, this is mostly the, um, the kind of the core model and the main channels are those market settings. Um, maybe there's a seasonal market, maybe there's some winter markets, but it's really that market venue. Um, and accompanying this kind of overall model, it's not a plan, this is just the model, um, is you know, the cost structure and the revenue. Overall for markets, by and large, their number one cost is going to be personnel, whether it's contractors or employees, um, professional services, and so on. And their primary revenue is going to come from vendor fees and, and some degree of sponsorships, grants, fundraisers, earned income, whatever that mix is. Um, and when we uh, did some digging in in King County, the average market expected or usually relies on over 70% of their operating budget to come from these vendor fees. And this is going to be very important as we get to the impacts of COVID. So this is again, mapping out that larger structure for farmers markets and how they're operating. We um, unfortunately don't do a great job of telling the story of the market organization because we're so excited about telling the story of the vendors and what they're doing. And so this is just a stepping back a little bit to understand that. We had a great conference in, in February in Tacoma and I really appreciate um, the food systems team being there and many of you and ABBA was there, which was terrific. And then shortly after that, we had this thing bubble up um, to start thinking about uh, what this new thing called the coronavirus was all about. So I'm, we're gonna kind of go rapid fire through some of the impacts of this um, now that we have a minute to catch our breath. From the get-go, the governor included farmers markets as essential services. So um, that was never questioned. They were always essential services particularly the food and farming vendors, not the artisans, prepared food, or other vendors, but the farm vendors were essential services. So we never had that issue at the state level. Um, and um, eventually, eventually we were issued guidelines from the Department of Health. Before that, there was a lot of figuring out that had to happen, and we worked nationally to kind of collect best practices, share best practices, do a lot of figuring out. And these are the state guidelines. As you know, in Washington state, local jurisdictions can require stricter requirements and guidelines. 
And in this case, um, as Jennifer will speak to, King County has um, required additional uh, uh, additional guidelines, additional re requirements for the King County markets. And then the city of Seattle has upped the ante even more. There's been a few jurisdictions throughout the state that have really, really um, been tricky for markets to work with and others that have been terrific. But at the state level, this is the baseline. It includes new operations and policies. It sets vendor limits on the vendor type and the spacing. They have to be at least six feet apart. Um, there are loads more um, staffing requirements and volunteers, the personnel has shot up. Um, markets are being redesigned. Um, lots of new signage, including health screenings not to mention the PPP, PPE and sanitation and hand washing, um, no sampling, no live music, no non-essential services, no kids program. This is a real impact on SNAP ed work. Um, and all of this was um, a, a real time figuring out process. And fortunately, farmers markets are incredibly nimble and able to meet these challenges. Safety has always been the number one priority and they've done a tremendous job and an incredible amount of work to make this happen. And so fortunately, being nimble and being having that flexible infrastructure has enabled them to stay open by and large. So, and they are providing safe shop shopping opportunities, which is super important as we all know. So I'm gonna go through a few examples of this and then we're gonna turn it over to Jennifer. Uh, but this has been an ongoing process um, and um, we could have a presentation just on this, but that's okay. Uh, we'll, we'll, give you, we'll give you a sampling instead. So uh, these are signage from the Jennifer's Markets at the U District back in, in March where we, again, new signage restrictions. In the city of Seattle, as Jennifer will mention, they are limiting the number of shoppers and also the um, having entrances and exits to each market. Um, this is a cultural 180 for us as farmers market organizers. We want lots of people. We want lots of um, connections. Uh, we want lots of uh, festive atmosphere. All of that was gone and we had to figure out how to make it work. And I should say um, it's been a real collective effort. Um, the, the market design it required social distancing, minimal contact, that spacing between the booths. Early days, there was a, an enormous amount of innovation in figuring things out. There is still figuring out going on, and that's one of the key things that we're gonna look for towards the future, is to figure out which of these innovations um, have potential to add value and continue to offer safe shopping um, for uh, for next year, um, if not further on. And so hopefully there's some real silver linings that can come out of this as well. This is the Everett market, as some of you may recognize, uh, pre-order, pickup, um, same market, a different perspective. Again, we see the EBT sign markets were continuing to serve the SNAP and FMNP shoppers. Um, if you just go solely to an online system, that can be problematic in terms of using SNAP. Farmers markets, they can make that work. Um, and here again, they're keeping the low contact um, spacing. This has since faded uh, a bit. This was, this was from the early days. Pre-orders have softened, drive-through drive has softened, still somewhat in the mix, but um, not as prominent as it was in March. Um, again, figuring out ways to maintain that relationship between the farmer or the vendor and the shopper. This is crucial for the relationship of farmers markets. It's often one of the best things they get is developing those relationships, figuring out um, having that, um, that uh, dedication to my farmer and so on and, and figuring out how their business is going to progress over time is super important and in this case, we have to um, figure out what that means. In this case, it's a maybe there's a pre-order that gets that gets handed off through the cart. It was all about safety and also meeting those public health directives um, so that we could stay open. Again, this is a broader view of the Ballard market. Currently, 
um, they are still limited in their footprint. They, you know, whereas, whereas this market might typically have upwards of 120, 140 vendors this time of year, they have been limited to 40. That has grown a little bit, um, but really they're at, let's round numbers, they're at half their vendor count right now. Um, and Jennifer will speak to that as well. Signage, another big thing is signage. We are fortunate to partner with the Department of Health to get some great signage out for markets. This is all available on our website in a bunch of different language. Um, Melissa Balding can help you with the different languages. Spanish and English are up there right now. And again, that was a major piece of what markets had to adapt to. This is the Camas Farmers Market, and you'll see that there's a line down the middle trying to control the flow, spacing people out. We're outside, we're safe, but um, we've got to uh, ask shoppers to, to cooperate and participate. We have to retrain vendors, retrain staff. Um, it's, it's just uh, uh, really turning on a dime. These are all very nice people wearing masks. I wish everybody was a very nice person wearing masks. It just doesn't happen that way. Um, and it's been a huge topic within our uh, weekly calls. Um, regrettably, there are people who um, feel that the market as their public square, feel that's the venue to make their point about masks. It's um, very regrettable and it's very hard on the market operators. Um, so, it's getting better, um, but it's a key piece uh, that we've been working on, as has the, the rest of the world, I think. Again, vendors have had to innovate. Vendors are required within the state guidelines to have a safety plan, and that means having washable surfaces, it means having low-touch transactions, not having um, customers touch product, and also um, trying to move move shoppers through a line very fast. One of the principles from public health is low, low time exposure, so we wanna move things through fast. Um, that's tricky because guess what? This is a, so, the, as I say, physical distancing is easier than the social distancing because people wanna connect. They have that need to connect. That's one of the value propositions of farmer's markets is having those places of connection. And so we have to manage that and, and, and we're very grateful for everybody's cooperation in terms of making that work. Um, this is the uh, Kittyhouse Valley Greenhouse, and as you can see, washable surface. They have a box off to the side where you put your money in. Change comes from someplace else. We have uh, chalk marks on the ground to show six feet apart where you stand. Um, they have their product uh, pre, uh, not packaged, but I guess, I guess it's packaged, but put together so they can hand it off. You're not touching individual tomatoes and so on. And so they've done a terrific job of uh, demonstrating uh, kind of the COVID, COVID sales environment. And again, it goes to the flexibility and the ability to adapt to farmer's markets with that nimble infrastructure that, um, you know, can be a little tricky sometimes, but it's turned out to be a real asset. Uh, here's another, again, with that washable surface, uh, wearing a mask, having product behind the lot behind the table and so on. And this is at the Proctor Farmers Market in Tacoma. Um, here we are in Richland. You're getting, I felt, hope, hopefully by now you're getting the feel of things. I hope you've been to your local market, but it's a little harder to get out to lots of markets this year. But again, we have the distance. In this case, they had the vendors park their cars in between to block people going in between. Shockingly, shoppers don't always follow your caution tape and flagging and signage. So um, everybody's doing their best they can to kind of make that work. Um, it used to be we just had to worry about tent weights. Now it's all kinds of stuff. Um, this is the uh, um, Enumclaw Plateau Farmers Market. It's a newer market in King County and they've done a terrific job of, of recruiting volunteers, of getting their community together, of organizing um, uh, the flow of shoppers so that they could, again, maintain that social distancing, maintain that pace, and, and make sure those sales. So um, I just want to hit on the point that usually, again, in terms of our cultural 180, usually markets are saying, everybody come, we need you to, uh, uh, we want shoppers. And this year, it's all about sending a designated shopper. It's sending one person from your household. And um, 
what are the implications of that? It's a very different experience. Here again, this is the Queen Anne Farmers Markets. And we have some creative hand sanitizing, clear exits and entrances. You're getting the picture here. This is the Wenatchee Valley Farmers Market. Again, well spaced out. And this isn't what we're normally expecting. This is, this looks like a slow market day. But in COVID, this is the market day that markets are having. And so the good news is that by and large, the shoppers that are coming are coming to shop. So that's something that's a real plus. And um, anecdotally across the state, um, the farms that are able to get into the markets, their space limitations, the ones able to get in are doing as well as or better than in prior years. So that's a real plus and something we'll look into carefully. Likewise, the SNAP usage is through the roof. Um, and again, um, just thinking about um, making this work for the farmers, making this work for the, com for the community, for the eaters, and um, trying to maintain these important market outlets is what we've been working on uh, so hard. Um, and as we look for forward to 2021, one of the things we know is these farmers want to know if the markets are going to be open next year. They want to know what they can rely on as they go into planning. This year, they had to turn on a dime with a dime to make it work. Next year, looking ahead, we want to be there for those markets, for those farmers, and have the markets that they're relying on so much. Um, and again, lots and lots of communication, figuring things out. Markets were closed. Markets were delayed. Um, we're fortunate in that um, uh, most are open now. And again, this is part of a needs assessment that the WSFMA we did in partnership with King County. And this is one just data point in terms of just again, showing all the different things that markets have done, are doing and um, have ad 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 adaptations they've been able to make um, to continue to serve their crucial roles. Um, there have been, of our memberships, 14 markets that did not open this year. Now, remember what we said about the local jurisdictions making things stricter? Remember when I said King County made it harder and Seattle made it harder? Well, the consequence of that is that 14 out of the 10 that didn't open are in King County and eight are in Seattle. Over half of the Seattle farmers markets did not open this year. And so that's something that uh, we take very seriously and need to work towards um, uh, a, a figuring out what's going to be the best game plan for next year. And Jennifer is going to jump in and tell you all about that. I just also wanted to note, as you know, closing and opening a, a market isn't like flipping a switch. You don't put the key in, turn it on, and the market goes zooming down the road. No, it's much more like building a campfire. You got to get all the right pieces. You got to get make sure it's not raining, you need to have all of the different components before, and you need that spark and you need to nurture that baby until it gets going. And so this is no simple thing to close a market or reopen a market, but we're um, working to hopefully bring these back online um, in 2021. But it's, a, it's again, one of those things that we're looking towards making sure that markets and are open so farmers can rely on them, shoppers can shop at them. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jennifer who's going to give you a few more dramatic details from the city of Seattle. Thanks, Colleen. Um, I will just spend uh, a, a handful of minutes kind of going over what has happened, ad ad addressing closures um, and sort of what happened back in March and April in the city of Seattle as everything um, was uh, coming to light around the pandemic and the closures of many, many businesses uh, across the state. And I'll talk a little bit about what's happened since uh, and give you some examples of, of where we're at today, how that's affected our operations, our activities, our partnerships, our um, farmers, uh, our shoppers. And, um, and then I'll spend just a, a little bit of time at the end talking about how we at the neighborhood farmers markets are working to close the gap. Um, obviously, farmers have been greatly affected by um, closure, closures of restaurants, closures of markets, lack of access to markets, um, whether that's on the customer's side or on their end. And so it's a wildly different year. And this uh, 
presentation and, and thinking uh, and reflecting on the past six months has been a really good opportunity to sort of for myself to comprehend um, all the changes and all of the profound differences that we have worked through um, in it, at the neighborhood farmers markets and in farmers markets across the state. Um, so you'll remember that um, we, so our organization runs three year round farmers markets and um, I think I'm still uh, grateful that the timing of the pandemic and the closures across the state occurred in March, which you know, is coming out of a, a, you know, a really limited time during the growing season across the state um, and that those closures didn't happen in August. But those closures did happen in mid-March in the city of Seattle. And most of our markets um, take place in the public right-of-way. So street closure permits were the thing, the sort of mechanism that was um, pulled. And those permits exist for not only farmers markets, but for concerts and festivals and events. And so we were sort of lumped in um, on a policy level um, uh, with those other sort of gatherings and events, which was a real hot button term and still is um, in, in this, during this time. Um, so uh, that occurred, the suspension of street use permits occurred in mid-March and it was not long after that that the governor's office clarified that farmers markets were an essential business. Um, but, but Colleen mentioned we were sort of having to work to figure it out, and that's what was going on during this time. Um, we immediately um, turned to figuring out how do we shift our operations to reopen? How do we advocate to receive that permission and build that understanding with uh, King County, Seattle Public Health, and, um, and the mayor's office in the city of Seattle? And those, the, those two um, agencies have been our primary partners, um, both in figuring it out and in keeping the markets um, going and um, operating safely. So we were, because we were operating year-round markets, we um, immediately turned to other parts of the nation. So the New York, um, the Grow NYC green markets and the um, Quasa markets in San Francisco, some markets in LA and turned to them and said, what are your best practices? Because some of them never closed and they were figuring it out very much on the fly. So we spent time learning from their successes and um, lessons and um, building that into our operating plans and going back and forth with King County Public Health, who's been a really imp important partner over the years, but primarily around food safety issues and not so much around how do you run a market safely in a, in a pandemic, which has a whole new set of questions. So those, um, the, the statewide uh, Department of Health guidelines for farmers markets um, were informed by this early work that Seattle and King County did together, but there are some significant differences in the city of Seattle. Um, you know, this, this image sort of demonstrates, you know, on the left in 2019, our markets in, in the peak of the year, you know, of the growing season in August might have anywhere from 3,000 to 8,000 people come through over the course of five hours. And, um, you know, we work to maximize that space and bring in a really great mix of vendors and products. And the photo on the left is, you know, markets are really limited and we have shoppers waiting in line to access the limited capacity inside of the market. Um, they're making the most of their market trip and we're limited right now in the type of vendors and products that we can include um, as well as the amount. So um, some differences include in Seattle, we have to have 10 feet of space in between vendor booths. In the rest of the state, it's six. Um, we have been limited. Uh, this has had a very significant impact, but we have been limited um, initially to around 25 and then it was 40 and now we're in the mid 50s um, in terms of the number of vendors that we can accommodate and that has severely impacted and had a profound impact on um, businesses who are not able to access these markets and, and use it as a way to connect with their customers. So we've seen a lot of individual businesses pivot and to find new sales channels or invest in CSAs or um, work cooperatively um, to aggregate products and get them to consumers in new ways. Um, 
uh, and and as I said, we're we're very limited in in terms of customer capacity. So where uh, you know before we may have had thousands, and now um, in in Seattle um, we're limited to and King County we're limited to having two shoppers per vendor in the market at any given time. So that capacity could be anywhere from sixty five people in the market to um, one hundred um, across the Seattle markets. Um, in, so kind of in, in this March and April timeframe, working to figure it out, as it were, we successfully reopened um, in April and June um, on a rolling basis. We first reopened University District, piloted a lot of the operations that we had worked out with um, King County Public Health and the City of Seattle, and then um, slowly reopened um, West Seattle and Capitol Hill. And Capitol Hill did not open until Gosh, early June, which um, again, it's a year round market. So we lost almost 11 weeks of, um, of time that would typically be available for farmers to connect with shoppers, which has been significant. So I think in, in Seattle, it's safe to say that we've sort of borne the brunt because of the fact that we've, we run year round markets and had to work kind of ahead of the curve um, before seasonal markets reopened to, to figure it out as it were. Um, and and I, I think this demonstrates that key point that, I mean, we've been able to adapt to the challenges of COVID-19. Some days that process and adaptation has felt very slow um, and been challenging based on changing information day to day, especially early on in the pandemic, without that understanding of um, what was safe, who was at risk, how do we prevent um, I will say we're in a flow now, but it, there have been profound and very quick shifts to operations based on um, all the changes in our understanding. But we, um, that's who we are. I would say the community in terms of markets and vendors is, is very adaptable and very flexible. And so um, uh, we rose to the occasion there and probably won't be the last time we'll have to do that. Um, Colleen, do you wanna advance the slide for me? I don't know if I have control, so I'm just gonna use you as my partner. So I wanted to use the framework that Colleen had built around the business model for farmers market and just talk about what has changed and give some specific examples. I, I won't go into all of this in these slides. I think will be posted. Um, Nicole and Laura will probably make that possible. Um, but really what has changed, I mean, in terms of partnerships, we as organizers for farmers markets carry partnerships on the on the vendor side on the shopper side and on the community side and there's a lot of kind of rich complex historic relationships in the at the community and at the um, government levels um, to make the markets work and so a, a massive change for us in seattle is that we now work um, with much more oversight and um, frequent conversation and review and reporting through the mayor's office and through public health. And they are working together um, to sort of ensure that markets continue to operate safely and adjust to, um, to kind of new rules and understanding around the pandemic. It's been a, a partnership and there's also been um, tension and sort of lessons in that as well as we've worked to educate them about the business model and viability, what makes farmers markets viable and what will what it what it takes right now to sustain us into our future. So it's been a it's been a two-way conversation and um, that has is is a great majority of my time these days is sort of triangulating between um, those relationships and reporting back to them. Um, Business districts have changed too. I mean, the relationship between farmers markets, especially urban ones, but this is true across the state. Formerly, this sort of there's this really amazing symbiotic relationship between a market being situated in a retail corridor and the small brick and mortar businesses, sort of drawing shoppers in and shoppers patronizing both the market and these businesses. And we've really had to work through some challenges about what does it look like to operate a market with a controlled perimeter and an effort to keep people safe and apart and distant in a really dense retail corridor. And so that's come with a lot of conversation and a lot of problem solving 
Um, and, and truthfully, everyone, you know, there have been some, some major challenges in, in terms of mitigating access to businesses um, and helping uh, shoppers understand the rules of, of the whole physical um, and community space. Um, but it's also been, uh, I think, an opportunity to refresh and deepen those relationships and figure out how do we capitalize on what it looks like to have a relationship in this moment um, and, and help um, everyone be successful because these small businesses are also um, greatly affected and, and hurting as well. Um, so for example, in Seattle, um, there's a program that assists restaurants in using curbside space to extend their restaurant you know, for outdoor seating. What does that look like during a farmer's market? How do we work together to accomplish that and work around each other? And, um, and those conversations have really bubbled up um, in significant ways. Um, so that's just a, a couple of issues on the partner side. Uh, in terms of activities and operations, I, I can't reiterate enough the, the profound changes to the market manager's role and um, their effort in redesigning markets, in managing communications with vendors. Who do we have room for? How are we prioritizing um, the markets for farmers? Who gets left out? Um, how do they keep shoppers safe and train staff to enforce um, without policing in awkward situations? And so there's really, as Colleen pointed to, you know, we've, we've become sort of the fun police in the markets and, and that has really um, put a lot of pressure on an already really very demanding role, especially for farmers markets who rely on volunteers or board members. We're really fortunate to have um, paid professional staff that um, have been with the organization for a long time and, um, and you know, signed up for one thing and, and, and are now having to rise to the occasion during um, the pandemic. So that's been a profound, profound change to their activities and they've been really incredible. Um, we have really amped up volunteer recruitment and training in the, at the outset. One of the requirements in the city of Seattle was that markets with you know 25 vendors had to have 12 to 15 staff that's the total size of our staff at the organization including you know part-time administrative folks and um and so we really had to draw a lot of time um down from from the team to staff the markets in this way as we were learning i'm happy to say that through some advocacy and i think just um setting up a good foundation for operating safe markets where we've been able to reduce that staffing requirement, but we still rely heavily on, on volunteers, which was not formerly the case um, for the neighborhood farmers markets. The same is true for fundraising. We've really increased due to a, a pretty significant decrease in income to the organization. Um, we've really increased our fundraising efforts. And, and actually that's been one of the, I think, really delightful and gratifying things to see during this time. You know, shoppers wanna support us, customers wanna support us. There's an alignment between people who donate and um, people who patronize the market. And so we have this wonderful natural constituency that's sort of ripe for fundraising and um, we're able to shift our internal um, you know, structure in the organization to invest um, staff time and, in fundraising and uh, are seeing success with that. And it's critical because I think as someone just said in the chat, it seems like the costs have gone up and the revenue has gone down and, and that could not be more true. Um, the business model has been really, um, a switch has, has flipped and we are budgeting for a deficit this year in the organization, but also relying on um, reserves uh, that have been built up over time and the fundraising effort um, in order to keep the markets on track and uh, have a runway into the future as we work through this pandemic. So um, how are our farmers and customers doing? Um, you know, this has been as hard on them as it has been on market organizers. Um, I think the, you know, the big question that everyone wants to know is our sales, you know, there's this, this uh, dissonance between a high demand for local food and a limited access to markets right now. And I would say that that's reflected in how our vendors are doing economically. 
some of them are really experiencing a significant decrease in sales, whether that's because they don't have an access to a market they typically sold in, or um, their, um, their product just isn't selling as well during this time. Um, and some farmers are experiencing a really high demand from customers who are making the most of those shopping trips and um, exploring new sales channels and really doing very well in this moment um, with the customer demand for um, local food and short supply chains. So I think there's a range of economic experiences, but it's safe to say overall in the markets that in their income is down. Um, and that is also affecting the, the organizers on the, on the market end as well. Um, I think the other thing we've noticed is that vendors, farmers in particular, are really spread across and, and migrating across new sales channels. So many farmers have invested in um, longer season CSAs to appeal to those customers who want a convenient low contact pickup um, and don't want to go to the grocery store or um, selling their products in new cooperatives or farm boxes that are being organized um, uh, by producers or you know, other business entities. So there is a migration happening that has led to some decrease in, in vendors in the markets, but um, also some, some vendors just being spread really thin across multiple sales channels. Um, and, and for customers, um, you know, they, uh, we really are, the markets are, when I, I, I'm so delighted and it, it warms my heart every single weekend, every single Wednesday, we're running these markets to see those shoppers who line up an hour and a half before the start of market. And they are there, rain or shine. And we're so lucky to have um, this segment of shoppers who supports um, these farmers in that way. Um, and it really is those core dedicated market shoppers who are always coming and using it as their um, source for groceries and, and, and less so for um, you know, social experience or um, an opportunity to sort of look and see and meet friends. Um, so those are, those are the customers that we're seeing and they are making the most of their trip. Um, we're seeing a, a high, average, um, high average spending in the markets and we've seen that on, um, We've started an online um, sales channel, uh, aggregating products from the market vendors and making those available for customers to pick up um, uh, as they pre-order um, online. And that average um, shopping trip is, is, has maintained, uh, I think between 60 and $70 uh, in the online, uh, for the online pickup options. Um, and, and it's safe to say too that markets, this is the last point I'll make, are, are limited. Um, they're less accessible to customers. So if people relied on public transit before and are now less willing to take that because we're in a pandemic or they don't have the luxury of time to wait in line, um, those are issues for a segment of the population and for shoppers and markets that, um, that have made the markets a little bit less accessible. So, um, let's advance one more slide. I think these are just some examples of like, what have we <laughs> delivered on? I mean, these are just images. Um, they represent, you know, an agenda. We've invested in more training and rolling out new requirements and um, sort of best practices in markets with farmers and with vendors and conducted Zoom meetings and um, kept them up to date in, in various ways and worked with them to, to make this a cohesive, safe, experience and stay nimble. We've, I haven't touched a lot on this, but we have invested a ton of time in advocacy, whether that's on rules that are limiting markets that are not rooted in public health that need to be changed, such as the, um, gosh, what's a good example of that? I think the, the, the limitation on the number of vendors, despite having space to um, be socially distant was, was a major effort early on. Um, another major effort early on was um, cut flowers were not included as essential items in the markets and that um, we worked with the WSFMA and with um, WSDA regional, you know, direct market programs um, with King County and with the Hmong um, Farmers Association to advocate for the inclusion of these as an agricultural product, particularly because many of those vendors are Hmong, Mian, and this is a profoundly inequitable 
um, uh, limitation um, that affected their, the, their growing season. Um, some lots of promotion around um, volunteering, lots of shopper communication. When are, when are the markets coming? When are they going? Um, and I highlighted Capitol Hill specifically because that has also been the nexus of protest activity in Seattle and was part of the reason for um, a late opening um, to the season, but also a couple of early closings based on protest activity in and around Capitol Hill. Um, especially after the clearance of the, the, the Capitol Hill occupied protest zone. So it's been an interesting time up there. Um, and, uh, and I think these are emblematic of all the communication and effort that's gone in multiple directions to keep the markets safe and open for our, these farmers. Um, and then the last slide, Colleen, if you want to advance, is just what are we doing to close the gap? And I wanted to highlight three things. Um, the um, Farm to Food Bank partnership has been, has emerged as a partnership between the neighborhood farmers markets on the supply side and relationships with farmers. Uh, PCC, the, the grocer here in Seattle, who has been the primary funder um, for this, this particular program, and King County Farm Share, which is the work of David Bobanik and others modeled on the Farm to Food Pantry program that emerged out of the WSDA. Um, this is this added up to um, wholesale contracts for approximately 30 small farms um, to provide product to food banks. Um, and that's been one of the things that has closed, um, closed the income gap for some farmers. And so we've we've contracted about $80,000 since June um, and are working in partnership. Um, and it's just been lockstep and really, really easy, which is not a thing that I say often about partnerships. Um, so we're really proud of that work and have Sam Kelty to credit uh, at, on our team um, for, for stewarding that. Um, we also, as sort of a, um, it sort of emerged out of the Good Farmer Fund, we have a history of providing financial stabilization and emergency funding for farms um, and have since April provided almost $200,000 in stabilization funding to 44 farms and food producers, processors as well um, as prepared food vendors who experienced uh, the market close, loss of markets or any sort of impact um, from uh, the COVID pandemic to keep them on stable footing and moving forward um, as they change plans. Um, and then we have, uh, we are now dedicating uh, time and staff time and um, some, some funding to um, selling uh, market products online. The platform is called What's Good and you can download the app and see what it looks like to be a shopper and choose the university district farmers market and put you know, 20 different things in your cart and go pick those up uh, at a booth on site at the market. And we have, I will definitely say we've been building the plane as we fly it, um, but in, in just five uh, to six weeks, it's been uh, provided over $200,000 uh, in sales to the producers and is not limited only to the farmers who are in the market. So um, that has really helped us. Um, uh, and these are just some examples of, of what we've done to close close the gap. Um, so I, you know, I think that just, I'll leave one key point here on the table that we've been working really hard and, and have tried to stay nimble um, to keep uh, strong um, sales outlets for these farmers uh, across the state. And uh, it would be nice to have a little breathing room to make sure that sort of the most promising innovations, we have the time to, um, to figure out and uh, what will make them most sustainable, what is going to be most valuable and impactful to growers across the state, and um, to really communicate effectively what farmers can expect during the next growing season. So we're coming up on that work right now, um, and it is our intent to um, continue to run strong, stable, safe markets uh, across the city for these growers. So um, thanks for letting me share.
Great. Well, thank you so much, Jennifer, and thank you for all your amazing leadership in this time, in these unprecedented times. And uh, so we're going to wrap up with just a few key points, and then we look forward to your questions. Um, just wanted to circle back and reflect on thinking about where we started before COVID, thinking about Jennifer's experience, and thinking about how this impacts the business model of farmers markets. So again, it really changes the value propositions of what markets are offering. Um, they're really focused on those essential businesses. Um, we're bringing some shoppers, not everybody, um, and they're there to shop safely. Um, and that has really, uh, really fundamentally shifted the, the model that we're, they're working towards and figuring out. Um, again, if we look at the market channels, again, part of the consequences of all this is to trying to um, explore new channels that can benefit the, the, the entire market community, the shoppers, the vendors, and the market organization itself, as, as Jennifer was just describing. And then really thinking through um, uh, the, the funding model as well. And, um, I, you know, big picture is that the costs have gone up and the revenue streams have been severely impacted. So with fewer mark vendors, fewer market days, that revenue stream that markets rely on has gone down. Like uh, in the King County needs assessment that we did, um, we are looking at those to quantify that, but the impact is extreme. And so um, that, ha will ha that has severe consequences for every market organization. They're under enormous stress to, to close that gap as well. Also, with regard to sponsorships that markets have relied on, those sponsors are in um, their own economic uncertainty, or they're not able to come to the market and have a booth. And so that has been an uh, important um, loss of revenue for markets as well. And then, as Jennifer alluded to, if you had a market in a business corridor and there, those employees aren't coming to the business, then um, then you've lost your shopper base. And uh, the Tumwater Farmers Market's an example of that. They're situated right, surrounded by city, uh, state employees. Well, they, they closed early because they realized their shopper base wasn't coming to work anymore. So all of these have, uh, have really put uh, farmers markets under enormous economic stress. And that's um, something that is um, going to need to be thought through. And how do we take this business model and make it sustainable for next year and moving forward and hopefully stronger as well. Um, with that, we just wanted to hit a few, uh, two, um, two key summary points. One is where are we? And then the next one is what's next? And so maybe Jennifer, I'll take this one and you could take the next one, does that work? Okay, right on. So where are we? I hope by now you're getting the message that farmers markets are essential. They provide essential markets for um, food and people need food and it needed in the community. There's an important aspect of supporting the local supply chain, all that stuff. All of you are really good at, at breaking apart and analyzing. Farmers markets are very um, adaptable. They had that flexible infrastructure to rise to the challenges, even though at great cost, um, farmers markets are providing safe shopping opportunities. Markets are outside, outside is safe, they've got really big aisles, and they have controlled measures to protect everybody, which is of course the most important thing. Um, and these sales outlets continue to be vital to those producers, um, even as they um, stretch into new market channels, and maybe they're complementary in some ways, but they continue to be vital outlets. Um, we also know that these markets are vital sites for shoppers with SNAP and Farmers Market Nutrition Program, that the demand is up. The Auburn Farmers Market hit a record um, a few Sundays ago with $965 in SNAP and $965 in SNAP market match going directly to uh, the producers at that market and also feeding who knows how many families. Um, and again, that's something the WSFMA is very involved with. Um, and again, we are these, this nexus of collaboration for the local food economy and Jennifer touched on all the different partnerships that happen and all the different opportunities for training and information flow and um, points of, 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 of building this um, together. 
And again, I think hopefully one of the things you're taking out of today's uh, presentation is just the extreme organizational stress that everybody's been under. And while there is uncertainty about the future, we're um, working hard to figure out what's next. And I'm gonna take, and Jennifer will walk you through this. Thanks, Colleen. Um, so what's next? Well, uh, farmers markets will absolutely need public support and specifically um, not just a fan base, but also funding and policy. And a wonderful example of that is the funding package that the King County uh, Council recently passed around uh, county agriculture, which included stabilization support for farmers markets that were open in King County. And so that is um, a heroic effort on their part. Um, and, and we will need to see more of that uh, in order to, uh, to stay stable and sustain into the future. And I was going to say sane, but <laughs> that's probably true too. <laughs> um, that, and, and as I alluded to, um, market organizations, big and small, may need to rely on fundraising and volunteers in order to close the revenue gap that um, has been created um, until they're able to adjust the business model or we move successfully out of the pandemic. Um, so for us, we're in the lucky position to have had that expertise on staff already. And for other market organizations, that will be new learning and capacity building for, for them. Um, and I think it's important to highlight uh, the psychological energy that it, it takes for market staff and managers, administrators and board members to sustain the markets in this moment. Um, you know, like grocery work, workers were really heroic at the outset of the pandemic. Um, and we have a lot of supporters there's also a lot of consternation about the restrictions, um, whether they're public health or, um, or other restrictions uh, in, in markets right now. And, and they're bearing the brunt of a lot of concerns and complaints that are new. Um, so we'll remember to treat them well and with a lot of love. <laughs> um, farmers will absolutely need to know what to expect from markets in 2021. 2021. Uh, I wish I had a crystal ball, but markets are going to be making the best decisions based on the information they have and the resources they have. Um, and we'll need to communicate those effectively um, and with some advanced planning time uh, for farmers to be able to plant and think about their season uh, and sales outlets uh, in the year ahead. I did mention that, you know, organizations will need to take time to look at uh, sort of the stopgap measures that they've put in place, uh, whether that was pivoting to make connections between producers and consumers that might not be sustainable for the long term and end up sunsetting, um, or what is it going to take to keep this solution around and how does it fit into the big picture for us as organizations and for um, the vendors and, and farmers that we're, we're here to support. Uh, a big thing too will be uh, we don't we don't like to talk about ourselves that much. I think that the work of market organizers has been invisible, and and even for me, you know, I've been in this role for two and a half years, and I'm personally grateful I had a year under my belt before the outset of the pandemic. Um, but I, I thought I knew what it took to produce a farmers market as a as a frequent shopper, frequent supporter. Um, and I really didn't, and, and it's hard to put into words what, what it takes and the complexity um, and the demands of, of communities, shoppers, and, um, and farmers, and being, what being situated in the middle looks like on a day-to-day -day basis. So I think increased awareness around what market organizations, what role they play, um, as well as the role that shoppers play in the future um, of supporting um, supporting this endeavor in local food. And, and farmers, I think this great for this group to think about too, with so many resource providers and assistance providers. Um, what does technical assistance look like for farmers and producers in the future? Um, over the next year in new sales channels with new regulation, 
Um, where do they need support and who is providing that in the larger system? Um, and how are we working together as partners to um, make that clear and accessible um, and supportive um, so that they can do what they do best? So that's it. So, and uh, with that, I just also wanted just to do um, a shout out to uh, Laura, and Laura Lewis and Laura Raymond, I don't know if she's on the call, and others of you that have been working together at the Food Policy Forum on an early implementation action report. And some of these ideas we've talked about have made it into this report, but that's an important opportunity to think through these things at the, at the state level, at the policy level. And so I just wanted to thank Laura for all her leadership around that and all of you who have put in a lot of meeting, a lot of Zoom time for that as well. So that's moving along, fortunately. And then um, uh, both of us have, both of our organizations have loads of information on our websites. I, um, hopefully that's another source of um, resources for, for all of you. And um, any, any last word, Jennifer? No, let's, so let's do some questions because we talked a lot. Oh, okay. Yeah, for sure. We're done. We're done. We're done. We're done. That, but, we, but it's been a big year. So we appreciate your patience and attention as we work through uh, the reflections of uh, our uh, 2020 to date. Yeah, thank you both so much. Let's open it up for questions. I know there were some in the chat and I think Jennifer, you were getting to those as they were being um, asked, but do we have other questions, comments? I saw that there was a question about whether the resiliency grants um, were still open and Jennifer said yes, send them their way. So if you have farmers and producers that are interested in that, and I'm assuming that's limited to farmers that participate in your markets, obviously. Yes, participate or did participate uh, if, in, the, in the past year. So absolutely. Jennifer, this is Gwen. Maybe a follow-up um, question to that. Are you, so it's, it sounds like you have money, but not farmers. Do you, and I don't know if you know the answer to this, but um, do you know if it's because farmers are set for the season <laughs> and they're, or they're just not thinking about grants right now because they're busy? Um, or, well, those are two different questions. Like uh, maybe the farmers are actually in a good position right now. Um, I don't know if you have a good sense. Yeah, I want to make sure I understand because you cut out for a second. But so we have, why do we have money left? Is the, is the demand not quite been there? Or? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so now I think it's, I mean, there's always limited time and attention and awareness, you know, if, if, so we've worked pretty hard to, to conduct outreach and make sure that people know that, um, that the money is available to them. I, we also were pretty strategic about at least the stabilization funds and making sure that the, the award is limited to 5,000 per producer. And that was by design to make sure that we um, met as much need out there as possible. So there's a small segment of folks who haven't applied um, for whatever reason, you know, whether it's reluctance or they feel they don't have the need um, and want that money to go elsewhere. So we'll make sure that it gets you know, spent down if that's a priority. Um, but there, I would say there's just about 15, well, probably, probably a little more than 20% of producers who have not applied for it in our system. Great, thanks. Yeah, absolutely. I have a question, just a clarification about that. When you say we and stuff, are you talking about just Seattle, just King County, or if someone sells at a farmer's market in the state of Washington? So for the resilience, are you asking specifically about the resiliency grants? Correct. Yeah. So those grants were specific to our organization and the 200 producers, farm or food um, that sold in our seven markets. Um, so those producers, again, are coming from across the state, but we did not have the funding capacity with this gift to 
broaden that to producers who sell in other markets across the state. So that would have been lovely. Okay. Can I we jump and add that uh, yeah. Pike Place Market also has a fund for um, uh, emergency farm support um, and that covers any farmers who sell at their markets. Um, and they're doing the same thing within the past year because four of their markets are closed this year. Um, but again, it's specific to the market participants of that specific market. Um, I also saw a question from Pat Months regarding the King County funding. And um, Pat, we put in a, a request to the council members um, for, for uh, distribution of the federal award CARES Act funding as part of a uh, omnibus uh, uh, coronavirus uh, budget. It was all approved in one huge package. It was a $1.4 million pot. Um, we're looking forward to distributing uh, about 410,000 to uh, farmers markets. We um, initially set that up so that markets can apply for 10,000 for the 41 markets. Um, but we're hoping we can, since only 30, 30 are open this year, um, distribute more where more is needed. But that's how it all came about as part of an omnibus CARES Act funding. Thanks, Patrice. Do we have other questions? You can put them in the chat box or you can just unmute yourself. Okay, well, just a reminder that we did record. Oh, we have a question here from Alan. What does we say here? Can you provide a comparison between farmers markets and supermarkets moving local produce relative to small farm local production? So does anyone have that kind of information? Do either of you, Colleen or Jennifer, have any comparisons? Not accurate ones. <laughs> Yeah, that's safe to say. I have sort of anecdotal stories or evidence about some new relationships between grocers and small um, producers who were typically direct to consumer, but I wouldn't feel particularly confident um, making a, a well-founded comparison. Yeah, I think that I think one of the key things to remember is that um, Usually the, the farmers selling to the farmers markets are usually have more than one market channel. You know, we like diversity. Diversity is supposed to help us manage risk and so on. And so some of them may also be selling to other other market channels or contracts. But at the farmers markets, it's really a strong foothold into that direct connection with the customer. So part of it is moving the product. Part of it is getting the whole retail dollar. Part of it is building that connection. Part of it is uh, having a gateway into these other uh, local food uh, collaborations and so on. And so I think it's a little bit of a tough analogy to uh, quantify and to pinpoint. And it really depends on uh, how you're looking at it in terms of uh, making that type of comparison. Great. Well, I just want to thank both Colleen and Jennifer today for their time. We did record this meeting, so it will be up on YouTube, and we'll make sure that we have um, their slides available as well. I want to just open it up now for um, other general discussion topics. You can still ask questions about the presentations as well. Um, see if there's anything out there that um, people want to announce, upcoming events, anything else that uh, you have on your mind. And I also wanted to just put a plug in, I believe next week, we were gonna try to focus in on some of the food, uh, food policy councils around the, the state, uh, local food policy councils and what they're doing right now uh, to support the uh, food and farm sector. Uh, so I believe that's what we're thinking about having lined up. I know Nicole is still on the call and she can clarify that for me, but 
um, I want to just again open it up for any other topics or uh, uh, items that people would like to share. Um, this is sort of related, sort of unrelated. I'm just curious, you both, you know, um, Colleen mentioned earlier about um, both WIC and the SNAP-Ed funds for markets. Where is the best place to go for information about what the market in my county can do? The market itself? or is there state information or somewhere else? When you, uh, well, in general, if you are interested in, I guess it all depends on what uh, types of things you're curious about what that market can do, whether it's a sort of a more at a level of a partnership or, or shoppers, uh, what they accept and so on. So absolutely that local market is going to be a terrific resource for you to find out what's happening at that market. Um, within each of the five major regions throughout the state, there are loads of um, people who are dedicated to working on SNAP-Ed um, and food access programming. Uh, so, um, and the, there's um, uh, the State Department of Social and Human Ser and Health Services has a, a community connections type of platform for that. So there's, there's quite a bit of information out there. Um, and not knowing where you're located, it's a little hard to say, but generally speaking, there should be local implementing agencies that are on the ground um, to help answer any question, build partnership, reach people, connect with markets, correct with connect with farmers. Um, I'm in Grace Harbor. There's a market. I know the guys. I can get in touch with them. And it's more about publicity. I'm thinking, if I don't know what the trade-in is on WIC, maybe the WIC folks know, but maybe they don't. So it's more about getting publicity out to people so that they know what they could do if they went to the market. That's right. And, to be, and just to be clear, the, from a, a WIC perspective, so the women, infants, and children, um, at the farmer's market, the, it's the farmer's market nutrition program uh, vou vouchers that they can use at the farmer's markets. And your local WIC office should be able to do that. We also have some information on our website. Uh, Catherine Flores at the Department of Health is in charge of that program, and she has information and, again, maybe can direct you, and maybe you can help uh, connect with local partners to help make sure that word's getting out. It's been a really hard year because a lot of the normal activities which involve um, cooking demonstrations or kids activities and all of this stuff has had to be reinvented. So it might be that this year is also a little, um, uh, we're having to retool in that direction as well. Yeah, great question. Any other questions or um, updates that people would like to share? I'll put another plug in for the quinoa symposium. It starts on Monday. So if you want to participate in any of that, uh, feel free to go to the website quinoasymposium.com and you can watch it live on the YouTube channel. Um, again, thank you so much for participating today, Colleen and Jennifer. It was wonderful to have you here. And if we don't have any other questions or anything else that people would like to um, share with us today, we'll go ahead and sign off. And we'll see you all next Friday. So again, thanks again for being here. And like I said, every week, this is the highlight of my week in terms of the work that we're doing and being able to connect with all of you. So looking forward to connecting face-to-face -face one of these days again soon. Go out and support your farmer's markets. Uh, go visit one this weekend. And again, thank you for being here. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you Laura. Thank you, Nicole. Mm -hmm.